Hello, and welcome to the Graduate Business Information Bootcamp video series. I'm Sarah Vital. I'm one of the librarians here at St. Mary's, primarily working with the School of Business. And in today, these three videos, we're going to talk about some background information that you're going to need to set a foundation for your research in the program and then beyond as well. The first video, we're going to talk about the information landscape, and then we'll move into resources at the St. Mary's Library to be aware of, and then also getting to know copyright a little bit. We're going to jump right in with the information landscape, specifically focusing on some problems in filter bubbles and algorithmic bias. I always like to start with this Twitter exchange from uh, Chuck D, the, the, the head of the rap group uh, Public Enemy from last year. And he, quote, he tweeted last year that there is zero excuse not knowing information in 2019 with a library in your pocket. Curriculum in this 21st century should focus on net literacy based on how to fully use and comprehend the gadget instead of being pimped out by the consumption of it. This sound, If you know Chuck D, this sounds very much like him. He's very much into um, um, you know, various kinds of social justice and um, anti-consumerism. Um, the response here is from a librarian, Kate Donovan, who says, us librarians are 100% here for information literacy. That is really what librarians of today do. We're not so much worried about you know, checking out books, though we do do that. What we're really in interested in is teaching everyone how to best use information in this landscape that is changing day by day. So in this information landscape, we want to be aware of two main things, and this is what I'm going to cover today. Being aware of filter bubbles and being aware of algorithmic biases. For more information about uh, filter bubbles, you can see Eli... Uh, Pariser's, I always say his name wrong, um, book from 2011 called The Filter Bubble, What the Internet is Hiding from You. I just reread this last year, and even though it's almost 10 years old now, it is really, really accurate. And he can expand it today to all the different things that we're using now that behave exactly the same as the resources that he used when he was writing that book. Also, in algorithmic bias, this is very much based on the research from Dr. Sophia Umoja Noble, um, a faculty member um, down in Southern California who recently published a book called Algorithms of Oppression, How Search Engines Reinforce Racism. She focuses specifically on racism and sexism inherent in, in algorithms. But in general, it's, a, it's important to be aware of the biases written into algorithms that sometimes we just take for granted. So we're going to start with filter bubbles and really focusing on what you're not seeing. If there's anything you take from today, I want you to remember that my internet is not the internet or your internet is not the internet. There is no one thing anymore. There is so much information that what is being delivered to you is very tailored specifically for you, which is in some ways a good thing. One of the ways this happens is through cookies and just that technology behind the scenes. Um, some of you may know well what cookies are, but they are basically a text file that records information about your behavior on a website. So there are session cookies where you go into a website and if you hit the back button, it knows where you were. So it remembers your behavior so that it can help you. There's also persistent cookies that live on your machine and every time you go back to the same website, you can like remember your password, you can remember your what you searched last time you were here. Um, these are persistent cookies that live until you get rid of them. There are also first party cookies where the company that you're dealing with is looking at your behavior. And there's also third party cookies where another company that you're not really working with at the moment is still on your computer looking at what you're doing. Now we don't have much control over this. Um, these happen automatically. We don't know that they're necessarily happening. I think sometimes we do a search and there's a couple internet um, browser plugins you can put that shows you how many cookies are happening. And it can be like up to 20, 20 cookies are put on your machine for every time you go to a website. And we don't necessarily know all that's happening there. The latest information is that up to 50% um, or most websites use cookies and up to 50% of those are persistent cookies. So they're staying on your machine and looking at what you're doing over and over and over again. And most of those are third party. We don't actually know that for sure. If you've been to websites recently, you'll notice um, you get a cookie warning, which is a lot to do with the law that passed in Europe about having to be informed about 
things being placed on your machine and tracking your behavior. Strangely enough, you can see the website um, for Top Gear, a British uh, TV show about cars that really talks a lot about cookies. Um, there are balances and trade-offs to these. I mean, most obviously, it's for our convenience that if we're doing some online searching and some online um, uh, research on some products we might want to buy, we, we kind of wanted to remember. So when we come back to it, we'll get things that are similar. But there's also trade-offs of a lot of our privacy is gone. Um, what we looked at one time will continue to be shared with other websites, and we don't necessarily have control over that. Um, sometimes we have the option to turn off cookies, and some websites just will not work. You've probably noticed that warning that if you disable cookies, you can't access this website. I mean, that's kind of a, you know, not much of a user choice there. You can take some time to go into um, your discussion forum in your class website and talk more about balances and trade-offs. You know, what are some balance or what are some advantages of cookies and why are they a good thing? But what can they put at risk and what other problems might there be? So you can talk about that with each other. Another thing to keep in mind are chosen networks. Um, our friends and our family are now connected with us online as well. So you know, even my mom is one of my Facebook friends. So what they share with us, it becomes part of our internet landscape. So the issue to keep in mind with that is that we usually associate pe with people who are like us, people who have similar interests or come from similar backgrounds. Even online, we still connect mostly with people that live near us. Um, we follow local news, news stations um, for the most part. Um, we also are friends and, and connections with people who make us comfortable. I mean, we've all probably had experiences where we've unfollowed or unfriended someone who, who we weren't comfortable with anymore. Why would we keep that around us when we don't have to? We also tend to be around people who support us and who confirm us. It's just natural human instinct to be with people that we like. That's already a made filter bubble. So everything that happens within these communities tends to be pretty homogenous. And that's something that we really need to be aware of. That when we see something shared on Facebook, it doesn't mean it's true. It means it's true for people that we liked to hang around with. Another thing to really be aware of is the algorithmic bias. And this is something that we overlook often because we consider Google and other search engines to be pretty neutral. Um, what well, the problem with algorithmic bias is it really changes what we get when we look for something. So the first thing to really keep in mind here is how does Google actually return our results? Remember I mentioned your internet is not my internet and it's not someone else's internet. It's always going to look different. My search results will probably be different than your search results for any number of things. And the reason that that happens is because of their 50, uh, 52 signals or 57 signals. There's probably even more signals than that. It's their proprietary algorithm that chooses from the millions of results that match and give you something tailored to what is your interest. Some of those signals include what you've searched for before, you know, going back to those cookies ideas. What have you been interested in? We're going to bring that back up again. It's also going to consider where you're logging in from. You know, that's handy when you're searching for pizza and you get your local pizza places and not the pizza places in New York or Chicago. That's not really handy. So it's good that that's limiting to where you're from. It also looks at things like what browser you're using. If you're outdated, it's, it's not assuming that you're very technologically savvy. It's also looking at the language you use. I mean, most of our results will come up in, in English if we're searching in English. It's looking at many other things, including personal profiles like our age, our gender, any other things that it knows about us. It's also going to find things that are popular. The things that are searched the most are going to come up first. The things that are searched the most in our area will come up first. The things that are searched by people we, we might be connected with in our profiles will come up first. So everything is going to be a little bit different for everyone based on their own profile, based on at least these 57 signals. Now I invite you to watch this video, or at least the segments listed here. This is Sophia Noble, who, is, who gave this really good talk at the um, University of British Columbia. She's given many talks. She's even come to St. Mary's and given talks here. 
Um, but this video in particular, she really talks about her research into why she gets interested in algorithms and why it's a problem that we rely on them too much. Um, in particular, she, she brings up the fact she used to be in marketing, so she knows that you know Google as a primarily an advertising platform is there to make money. And it's not an altruistic search engine tool. It, it really is an advertising platform that is trying to push results that will end up making them money. Um, artificial intelligence is not inherently neutral. It is built by humans with our human problems. Um, so she talks about that. She also talks about our um, statistics that show our over-reliance on algorithms, where we used to trust an expert or trust ourselves, and now we just let the computer handle it. My example for this is always if you're, you're using like Google Maps or any kind of navigation, and you're just following along with the directions, and it says, turn left, and you've been there before, and you're like, no, really, I think I should turn right here. But then we end up turning left anyway, well, because, you know, maybe they know better that we kind of abandon our own decision making in lieu of thinking the algorithm is going to be right. That can be a problem. And in the last section, um, the, it's about six minutes and it is heavy. I will warn you um, that deals a lot with racism. It talks about how someone who didn't know much about a topic started to do some feeling around on Google and used some really bad information that he happened upon, but agreed with his opinion to really form an identity that actually led to tragic results. So again, it's that warning that if we, unless we interrogate the results and really second guess what we're getting, we're leading into a, big of, a bit of a problem. Um, one of the ways she got into this research was when she started looking, again, her book primarily about racism, and she talked about searching for black girls. When she used the term black girls, what kind of results she found. Um, and a lot of criticism was that a lot of the things she, find, she found were inappropriate, um, possibly uh, sexually suggestive. And a lot of people said, oh, that's just the way it is. That, that's, if you search for girls, that's what the internet is going to give you. But she started to look at how different people started to see different things. And so I did the same experiment with my friend who I'll, I'll call Average Joe. So I searched, we, and you'll see from the, the timestamps, this was done at the same time. So I searched for black girls, and this is the result I got. I live in Oakland. Um, I was in Oakland. It was 930 at night. I, I was in my apartment when I looked for this. Um, I can probably see the Black Girls Code um, organization's building from my, from my window. I mean, they're just literally like a mile away. So they're using a little bit of that um, location to figure if I'm looking up black girls, I want to know about this organization called Black Girls Code. Um, the images there are of the founder and of some participants in the organization. And then the location, where it is. It's very close. I asked my friend Joe, I sent him a text message. I was like, Joe, can you do this search for me? Just to see how his results. He searched for the same thing. He's on the East Coast, so you'll see it's at, at 12 a.m. The exact same search. I looked at mine a little bit later to screen capture it. Um, his results, very different. So he got Black Girls Code as well. That's going to come up to the top because it's, um, it has the name and the title, and that's a, a big hit for search engine. But his images are not of the founder or of this young black girl who is involved in this organization. His was a little bit different. So we've talked about what are the 57 factors that could have played into this. Well, honestly, it could be search history. It could be profiling him, assuming that he's male, that he might be interested more in this. Um, it could be the time of day that he's searching at midnight. Maybe he's not looking for educational opportunities at that particular time. So a lot of the factors play into how you're going to be given results. And that's an important thing to really remember. So all of this is a part of the race to relevance. Um, we can't look through every little piece of information that's out there. We have unprecedented amounts of information, but it's coming at a cost. We're missing out on a lot of things or we're being pushed into something that maybe we don't want to be pushed into. So these are the lingering problems with this new information landscape of artificial intelligence via um, 
search engines or any other kind of algorithmic things. It's reasoning who we are from data inductively. And inductive reasoning is good. It's, you know, a, a huge part of scientific discovery. Um, but induct, inductive reasoning isn't always accurate. It, it's not going through a double check to make sure the assumptions based on, well, nine out of 10 men liked this, this other man will like this. It's not always correct, and it can lead to some stereotype problems. It's also feeding our strongest cravings. Yes, we are often going to click on that, that fun thing because we, we crave something fun. And that's not always the healthiest option. Just like our bodies crave sugar because in nature that's one of the hardest things to find, right now in our grocery stores, it's the easiest thing to find. So we really pile up the sugar because we're craving it, but it's not really what we really need. It's also pulling information from amateur curators who are not always the most informed. So instead of seeing something edited by professional editors, we're seeing a bunch of people pulling together sites that they think are interesting. They're not necessarily trained or experienced in weeding out things that shouldn't be shared. And it's also reinforcing what we already know, like, and believe. So again, it's based on what we've liked in the past, it's going to give us more of what we like. Um, it's not really allowing for any kind of growth or exploration or serendipity. And this is a problem, especially again, with entrepreneurial spirit. If we're looking for data to enhance this new idea, we don't wanna be looking at Google because that's only gonna be looking at the past and reinforcing what's already been done. So what do we do about the bubble? Well, awareness is key, knowing the how this works as much as we can. Again, a lot of the algorithms and, and bubbles that we're in are, are um, proprietary, so we don't know exactly how they work. We just need to know that there is something working there. Be aware of your privacy settings. Turn stuff off. Empty your cookies. I have mine set to empty every day. That is a pain. Sometimes I, you know, was really wondering which t-shirt I was looking at yesterday, but I've made that choice to clear them every day. Seeking out alternatives. So even if you have answered something, check again. See if someone else has an alternative point of view. Just because all of your friends believe it doesn't necessarily mean it's going to be the best alternative because we're not going to question each other very much. Use sites with clear policies. So this is, again, something that the European Union has done, and we're kind of forced into it. Every time you go to a new website, you have to approve the, the policies. This is important, and that's a good step, that we're being reminded all the time that we are allowing this to happen. And we need to be reminded, oh, if I go to this website, they're going to know what I do. Vary your paths often. It's kind of like you're less likely to get in a car accident if you drive different ways home every day um, because you, you continue to you know, keep yourself guessing and you pay attention more. When you know that you're going to vary your path, you'll start to see things and be a little bit more aware and you're not just doing it by instinct. And that's really important to do in, you know, obviously in driving, but also in, in your own research. It's hard to do sometimes since we do live in such a digital place, but browsing a physical space when possible is also a pretty under, under, um, underrepresented thing that we do. Um, it's underrated. Picking up a magazine and looking at the articles page by page will give you a little bit more of a, um, a boost than just looking at the article you like online. Seeing what other things are there, I'm like, oh, I didn't know that I liked that idea. Huh, let me look at that a little bit more. Some of the best things I've ever experienced in my media consumption are, are things that just happened. I joke that one of my favorite movies of all times is Independence Day. It's a movie, a action movie about aliens, which is nothing I would ever have looked for. Um, but it just happened to be on TV one day. I caught it and I just loved that movie. So browsing in that kind of way and letting serendipity happen is really important to your growth. Demand more social good from your media companies. So that's another thing we can do is, you know, hold Facebook, hold Google, hold all of those things to the fire to make sure they are making the right decisions. 
and then also support legislation that increases that transparency, much like the European Union did. Maybe we can't tell them not to do it, but we can at least tell them to tell us what they're doing. And finally, what can we do about our searches? Again, awareness. Be critical of those results. You're getting a different result than someone else. Why are you getting the results that you are getting? Are those the best results? Question that. And ask the same question in multiple ways. It will give you the answer to what you're looking for. And if you ask it in a positive way, like, what are some benefits of XYZ? Ask it the same question the opposite way. What are some disadvantages of XYZ? Because if you're not going to get a full spectrum of the question and the answer if you're just looking at it in one way. Go past page four or five of your results. Um, the most relevant things usually do come to the top and you don't want to go to page 55 of the results, but go past page four or five. Usually now the first page of results is mostly the ads and the um, recommended kinds of things that Google's trying to help give you an answer. Go to four or five to really start seeing, okay, what's the spectrum out here? Use different and multiple search engines or sources. So if you always look at the New York Times, maybe look at the Wall Street Journal as well. Um, we don't usually use um, many different search engines. Google kind of is the monopoly there. Um, but maybe use Bing once in a while. Maybe use one of the library databases. Change it up a little bit and see what kinds of different things you'll get. Also, go directly to those chosen sources. Don't let Google give you uh, the answer to something when you can say, I want to know the opinion of these three experts. I want to go to those sources. Go directly to them. And then again, check in with experts. That's an unprecedented time where we can actually do that. Of course, now you're enrolled in a graduate program. You have experts as your teachers and your professors. Ask them for information. Um, chat with your new colleagues. They're going to be experts in their own ways. You can even like send an email or a, a tweet to some of the biggest you know, thinkers in the world. Why not? We have, we have this chance to check in with experts. We should be doing it. Okay, so the next video will focus on resources specifically at the St. Mary's Library um, that some of them have the same algorithmic problems, but um, we'll investigate some of the ways that you can probably streamline your research a little bit using these professional sources.